Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everybody, all the participants from online and offline. My name is Yung Wan Kim, uh, Planning Director of Asia World Council and Senior Manager of K Water. I'm very happy to stand before all of you. From now on, the Jeju Forum special water session for partnering for Asia water issue dissemination and water repair enhancement will officially begin. Firstly, I'd like to invite Dr. Jung Jin Lee, the Vice President of Chief Global Office of KWR, who is an expert in water resources management governance, will deliver the opening remarks. Please welcome him with a big round of applause. Good afternoon. I'm Jong Jin Lee, the Vice President and the Global Chief Officer of KWATA. I would like to extend my appreciation to all of you who have joined the 2021 Jeju Forum session. Partnering for Asia Water Issue Disse Dissemination and Water Welfare Enhancement. My appreciation also goes to our particip particip participants on site. Dr. Donggyu Lee, Director General, Climate Change, Energy, Environment and Scientific Affairs Bureau, and Ministry of Foreign Affairs. President Hang Hyun Lee at Sejong Institute. Dr. Kyung Nam Shin, Assistant Director General at GGGI. Program Director Jun Kim at Seoul National University Asia Center. Professor Sung Ho Lee, a Korea University Graduate School of International Studies. I further extend sincere gratitude to online participants. Director German Bellas Switch, Mitigation and Adaption Division GCF. Dr. Javier Lu Plav, the Principal Administrator of OECD, and Ms. Soren Ledoz, Environment Affairs Officer at UNESCO. The vision of Jeju Forum in providing platform to facilitate original, uh, regional discussion and cooperation, peace, and common property is closely related with AWC's mission to enhance sustainable development by raising global awareness on Asia water issues and global water problems. As you are well aware, SDG 6 is close cutting issues linked with other SDGs such as climate change, economic growth, bio, 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 bio authority, and gender equality. In addition, the importance of water and sanitation and re-emphasized as we are going through COVID-19 pandemic. With less than 10 years to achieve 2030 agenda, it is crucial to change perception of the international community and facilitate ambitious action to solve water problems. We this recognized AWC aims to maximize water benefits and create new momentum for SDG 6 achievement through the Global Water Welfare Initiative and Water Project. Therefore, I cordially ask of all of our, all of you to share your expertise and in valuable op opinions in today's session to disseminate Asia water issues and enhance your welfare. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Lee, for opening the session. Next, I'd like to invite Dr. Dong Kyu Lee, 
Director General of Climate Change, Energy, Environment, and Scientific Affairs Bureau, and Minister of Foreign Affairs to deliver his congratulatory remarks. Dr. Lee served MUFAR for more than 20 years, focusing in environmental issues. Please give him a big round of applause. Uh, distinguished guests, all participants, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, a uh, good afternoon and uh, good morning in different time zones. It is my great honor to join the experts from various organizations today to discuss ways to solve water issues in Asia. I would like to express my gratitude to the Asia Water Council AWC Secretariat for hosting uh, for such a meaningful event at this session at the Jeju Forum, a venue for multilateral cooperation for peace and uh, prosperity. My special thanks goes to all participants connected virtually, especially. AWC is the first water-related regional organization in Asia, established in 2015 at the initiative of Korea with a view to tackle Asia's water issues. Today, 140 organizations from 27 countries are participating in the council and are working on the various water projects to solve water issues in member countries. In particular, AWC has been carrying out a joint research project with the OECD and the Ministry of Environment of the Republic of Korea to improve water security in nine Asian developing countries. All these efforts have been significantly contributing to expanding Korea's cooperation in Asia and in the world. I hope that AWC's standing as the leading organization in Asian water governance will further improve through cooperation with the Asian National Assembly Water Consultative Board, AAWC, and the successful hosting of the second Asian International Water Week in Indonesia this November. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, Global water crisis cannot be solved by a single country or organization. In the light of this, I believe that collaboration between various stakeholders with different perspectives and uh, capabilities is essential. I hope that this session will provide an opportunity for each organization to share diverse knowledge and experiences to contribute to uh, partnering for Asia water issue dissemination and water welfare enhancement. Ladies and gentlemen, the COVID-19 pandemic has a highlight, highlighted once again the importance of clean water, sanitation, and hygiene in the value, uh, vulnerable groups. In addition, water is an integral topic in the global discussions on environmental issues, such as climate change and uh, carbon neutrality. In line with this global trend, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Korea will render full support to ensure that Korea plays a leading role in achieving the SD6 water and sanitation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. Now we will invite two distinguished uh, keynote speakers. Firstly, we have uh, Ms. Solana Lepdos, the Environment Affairs Officer of UNESCO. She uh, joined the United Nations in 2009. She has a specialty in capacity building of biodiversity and ecosystem service. And we also have so Sokyu, the Secretary General of Asia World Council. He is Director General of Global Cooperation Division at k -Warder. So firstly, please welcome Ms. Uh, Dose. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can you hear me fine? Yes, we can hear you. Great, so I'm gonna, I have a few slides. 
Thank you so much for having me today. I'm very grateful to be uh, in this meeting. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm going to share my screen because I've got a few slides. I've been um, asked to present today on SDG 6 in Asia and the Pacific. Uh, and then I'll share a few uh, initiatives that we have um, in SCAP in terms of SDG 6 and cooperation in the region. So first of all, just to give you a bit of a highlight on what uh, SCAP uh, is, it's the Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. And our work on SDG 6 uh, is, uh, is uh, diverse. First, we promote regional collaboration on environment, and that includes water throughout the region of Asia and the Pacific. Then we lead regional follow-up and review, so in, in short, that's monitoring of all SDGs, including SDG 6. We support uh, the de designation of focal points for SDG 6 monitoring, and we promote SDG 6 reporting at the regional and global levels. We co-facilitate the UN Water Expert Group on Regional Collaboration on SDG 6. We promote integrated environmental approaches, nexus approaches, including on water, and we provide technical support to countries. So with that being said, I've been asked to provide you with a little bit of an update on what the SDG 6 uh, status is in Asia and the Pacific. Uh, and I will do it on the basis of the SDG 6 gold profile. You see the cover here, and it's been developed in 2018 as a collaborative effort from all the United Nations organizations involved on SDG 6. So basically what the gold profile tells us is that we're not on track to meet SDG 6 goals and targets by 2030. That, uh, and that Asia and the Pacific only has 30% of the world's water resources. So with the lowest uh, per capita water in the, in the world. Uh, we have a big issue with wastewater because 80% of it is uh, not treated before being released into freshwater streams. Half of the rural population has no access to improved sanitation. Uh, we have issue with persistent pollutants that are making their way into water resources from different sources. And we have increased water competition among, among sectors, uh, and that is threatening in particular food security. So I just wanted to show you a few figures. Um, uh, on the positive side, 94% of people have access to improved drinking water sources. Uh, this is a 20% increase in South and Southeast Asia since 1990. And uh, the issue there again is in terms of wastewater treatment is as low as 4%. Um, in terms of groundwater, there's a big stress also here, uh, and it's mostly increasing because of unsustainable withdrawals of fresh water. Um, in terms of uh, access to sanitation, 1.52 to 52 billion people in the region are without improved sanitation in 2012. We have issues relating to the decline of glacier lakes that's affecting major river basins. Um, however, we have a progress in terms of access to safe drinking water and access to sanitation, which is very positive. I just wanted here to highlight also the impacts of climate change on water issue, which is uh, multifold. Uh, it affects water scarcity, ecosystem degradation of fresh water uh, and river ecosystems. It uh, can have an effect on pollution and water con contamination, and mostly also on floods and droughts. So um, I invite you as well, if you want more information on SDG 6 and uh, status per country and in the region to access the SDG 6 data portal. Now I'm gonna highlight a few of the elements uh, that ESCAP is involved in, in terms of partnerships and activities in the region on SDG 6. Uh, the first one is our organization of uh, an intergovernmental meeting that we have annually. It's called the Asia Pacific Forum in Sustainable Development, APFSD. And as part of this, we review uh, collaboratively with our member states and also uh, UN agencies working in the region, the status on sustainable de development goals, including SDG 6. The forum also reviews um, the, the voluntary national reviews that are prepared by countries, and that might also include SDG 6. Uh, I wanted to highlight also a little bit of the statistical work that we're doing uh, in ESCAP. Uh, here, um, it's a, it's a snap, snapshot of the SDG progress report uh, in Asia and the Pacific that shows progress or actually uh, regression in terms of progress on SDG. And for SDG 6, you will see that uh, we have a few issues. 
Uh, first of all, the ones that the indicators for SDG 6 on the right hand side that are highlighted in yellow are the ones for which we need to accelerate progress to achieve the 2030 target. Uh, and the red ones is, are the ones that we actually are observing a reversing uh, trend, which is very alarming. And that's the case for water use efficiency. And you will see as well that for some of the indicators of SDG 6, uh, we don't have in, in enough data to actually measure it, which is a, uh, another issue. So just to uh, summarize the, the policy recommendations that the SDG 6 uh, gold profile uh, developed jointly with the stakeholders, governments, and UN agencies, uh, it's really um, advocating for the promotion of a better governance for water, for innovative and creative financial strategies, for education and training on water-related issues, uh, for the promotion and the enhancement of transboundary approaches, uh, looking also at innovation, at enhancing national monitoring systems, and also looking at strengthening uh, integrated SDG 6 planning and implementation. Now I'm going to explain to you uh, what the SDG 6 Global Acceleration Framework is. This is part of the initiative that's uh, uh, created by UN Water. Uh, it was launched with the full backing of the United Nations family to mobilize action across government, civil society, the private sector, and the UN uh, to better align efforts, optimize financing, and enhance capacity and governance. Uh, it is hoped that this framework will drive progress in five key areas, optimizing financing, uh, more and better data and information, capacity development, innovation, and better governance. Uh, since the launch of the Global Acceleration Framework, several initiatives have come to fruition. For example, the Water and Climate Coalition, that's a community of multi-sectoral actors guided by high-level leadership to address water and climate change challenges together, and with the Secretariat hosted by WMO. Also, the Hand Hygiene for All Global Initiative that's led by UNICEF and WHO that implements WHO's global recommendations on hand hygiene to prevent and control the COVID-19 pandemic and work to ensure lasting infrastructure and behavior. And lastly, the SDG 6 Capacity Development Initiative led by UNDESA and UNESCO to comprehensively support countries in their capacity development demands by better coordination across the UN water family. As you can see on this photo, the SDG 6 Global Acceleration Framework was launched with the full backing of the UN family. And with this launch last year, we started a journey towards 2023, with, which will mark a milestone in the progress towards achieving SDG 6. On World Water Day 2023, there will be the first UN conference on water in almost 50 years, where we will undertake the mid-term comprehensive review of the implementation of the objectives of the International Decade for Action on Water. This is a major milestone and an opportunity to initiate global, regional, and local projects and actions to accelerate progress. On a regional level, to contribute to accelerate progress, this is what we're doing under the umbrella of UN Water. Uh, first of all, uh, UN Water, just for a short description, is an interagency coordination mechanism that coordinates the efforts of United Nations entity and international organizations working on water and sanitation. And we've just set up a new regional discussion group that will support the UN water process globally, as well as the UN decade for action on water, including its midterm evaluation that I just talked about. So just very briefly, I'm going to go through a few slides now that will show you what ESCAP's activity are in the field of water project-wise. Uh, we're promoting a nexus approach, so an integrated uh, approach between, for the management of energy, water, and food. We're also helping countries um, to adopt integrated policies on water. And here you see a mapping that's been developed uh, multi by multi stakeholder group, and that's looking at linking uh, the SDG 6 uh, indicators with other SDGs. So it helps, again, to see the co-benefits uh, and the potential negative impacts of uh, any kind of decision policy-wise. Uh, we have a stream of work to try to target and to limit industrial wastewater pollution, um, coming from the, 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 the observation that there's an increase in water scarcity and decrease in water quality. So we have developed a series of policy briefs and training on this. We're also very active in terms of uh, combating marine litter. Uh, you see here an example of the Closing the Loop project that focuses on municipal waste management and the informal waste management sector. 
uh, we have a couple of e-learning courses that look at marine plastic filter reduction and also uh, joint SDG 6 and 14 action for so freshwater and the ocean. We have also developed a policy brief that looks at the impact of uh, together at the importance of uh, water and sanitation uh, in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. And here you see a, a, a few key messages. And finally, uh, we also work on supporting countries and specifically cities uh, throughout the region in terms of integrated water management in cities. With this, that's it. I've uh, reached 10 minutes. I thank you. And I'm available for any questions that you might have. Thank you, Ms. Dos. It was a very uh, informative and insightful speech. We, next, we would like to invite Dr. Mr. So uh, Sokyu for the keynote speech. Yeah, good afternoon and good morning. I'm Sokyu So, the Secretary General of AWC. Uh, I'm very pleased to deliver keynote speech in this valuable session. Yeah, my presentation is three parts. Uh, first, I will introduce a AWC Asia Water Council. Next, about the second AIWW. Last, about glo global water welfare research. Uh, let me introduce AWC first. Sorry. Uh, so one part missing, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> one slide is missing. A water environment is changing very rapidly. Uh, last year, heavy rain and flooding hit large parts of Asia, including China and Japan, and caused many casualties and damages. Korea also damaged Serious in many areas with the period of rain during the monsoon season. Uh, without a doubt, water has become the most important global agenda. However, we cannot solve this water related problem with a single organization and country. Uh, with, with this regard, there have been many initiatives to cope with climate change and COVID-19 pandemic, such as UN Declaration of Water Action Decade and water sanitation programs. As I mentioned early, earlier, Asia is one of the most vulnerable regions to water-related disasters. So that's why AWC was founded in 2016 to set Asia's water issue at the top of the global agenda and to promote sustainable development in the region with innovative water technologies. Uh, mission and vision are like this. And current, the member are 147 organizations from 27 countries. LWC members uh, consist of four parts, public and international organization, research institution, and private enterprise. With our members, we are carrying out various collaborative activities and practical water projects to strengthen the regional unification. Uh, LWC's four main Activities are AWC labeling, water project, AIWW, and global water welfare program. First, AWC labeling is two label projects that are currently developed by the AWC members, which could be used as demonstrators for the various water issues faced in Asia. Next, AWC water project is to support 
plan and design selected projects that are proposed by different countries. It is the specialized program that AWC offers to its members in order to tackle Asia water issue through, through practical solutions. Starting from 2016, AWC accomplished 10 different business and eight projects will officially begin from this year. Uh, next, I will introduce the second AIWW, which is another main event that AWS is organizing. AIWW is Asia's representative international water conference that's held every three years. This is a platform to share possible solutions to Asia water issue between global water agendas, uh, global water leaders, and various stakeholders on the six main themes. The first AIWW was held in Korea. The second AIWW will be held this year, November, in Bajo, Indonesia. Uh, there are three pillars of second AIWW, Asia World Statements, Asia Water Issue, and Water Project Business Forum. Among them, uh, Water Business Water Project Business Forum is to seek feasible water projects and financing opportunities to promote adaptable and practical solutions to achieve SDG 6. And now I'll talk about the main topic of today's session, global water welfare research regarding the objectives, procedure, and engagement. Uh, welfare is very common concept in Korea. However, in some Asian countries, it's a very critical issue. So uh, last year, Korea uh, Water Welfare Index was developed by K-Water in advance in last year. Under the comprehensive concept of water welfare, it incorporated three assessment area of equity, safety, and health to examine 160 municipalities in Korea using quantitative data. As there is no research done to develop index or international water welfare, AWC wants to apply the concept used in Korea Water Welfare Index after advancing and sophisticating the method. Uh, the objective of a report is to act as a supporting tool to help decision making on water policy and investment. Welfare reports will go through, through three stages, diagnosis, prescription, and feedback. Diagnosis is to identify priority areas. Prescription is to provide country-specific solutions and feedback is to evaluate the outcomes. Through this process, water report will assess water welfare status of each country, identify gaps in assessment area, and suggest priority focus areas. Here you can see the flow chart of uh, welfare report process. Throughout the entire research process, AWC aims to include AWC members along with international organizations such as OECD and ADB and as members of a high-level advisory commission. I'd like to emphasize the importance of AWC member engagement throughout the process. We encourage active participation from our members to give feedback in every step of research in order to make the study more precise. We hope this report acts as a stepping stone to implement customized solution and maximize capacity in the water sector. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Secretary General. Uh, now uh, it's time for our panel discussion.
The panel discussion will be moderated by Professor Sung Ho Lee at Korea, National, uh, Korea University Graduate School of the International Studies. Along with our moderator, we have three on-site panelists and two online panelists. I'd like to introduce each of them. Uh, Dr. Sung Ho Lee, President of Sejong Institute. And, uh, uh, Sang, Sang Yun Lee, uh, president of Sejong Institute, I'm sorry. Uh, and <laughs> Dr. Jong Nam Sin, assistant director general of the Global Green Growth Institute. <laughs> director Jun Kim uh, from Seoul National University Asia Center. <laughs> now we have an uh, uh, online panelist, Dr. Joman Velasquez, director general of mitigation and adaptation at Green Climate Front. <laughs> Last but not least, we also have a doctor, Xavier Laplace. So from now on, I'd like to uh, pass the floor to the moderator, Professor Lee. Professor, please take the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very delighted to come here and to moderate this session, uh, such a uh, uh, distinguished uh, speakers and also researchers on this topic. Uh, before we move on to the, our panelist uh, discussion, I would like to summarize a few points from the keynote speeches. Uh, first, Ms. Doze, she talked about the uh, varieties of works of UN ASCAP and also uh, showing us about how the UN or UN family they have done to about how to do uh, push forward the SDG achievement as well as also the WASH activities, which is nicely connected to the how we can really deal with COVID-19 efforts. And also that so she also talked about the, not only about SDG 6, but also other SDGs where they are all related to uh, the water issues. And also I'd like to mention about the um, Mr. Sir. Uh, he talked about the AWC, uh, the origin and also activities. And most importantly, uh, we're going to have the a big session, Asia International Water Week in November in, in, in 2021 in Indonesia. And also that he emphasized that the, the very much innovative work of the AWC and also team up with the Korea K Water, a global water welfare research and initiative, which will be also discussed by also partly by OECD because they also developed the water governance index or related ones. So which means also related to social dimension of the, our development which is also, we shouldn't really forget when we talked about COVID-19, economic recession, or how to recover all these issues. Anyway, so these ones are some of the uh, major takeaways from this keynote speech. So I'd like to move on to the uh, number one. There are two parts of the panel discussion. Number one is about a common question, and the other one is about the uh, tailor-made question to each institution. So that my common question is about, now we are facing economic difficulties because of COVID-19 global pandemic. And at the same time, we understand that we are heavily hit by the uh, climate change induced water related disaster last year, for example, in China, Japan, even in Korea, we got several heavy uh, the raining sessions. Because of that, we should really think about how to cope with this economic recession, as well as also uh, caused by global pandemic, as well as also climate change related disasters. So please tell us about the, uh, how, a, how Asian countries we can really cope with these uh, unprecedented challenges, as well as also if you have some idea about how to give some comments or advice on Korea and also multi-stakeholders, how to cope with the water-related as well as economic issues under the, uh, the heavy uh, COVID-19 global pandemic period. So let's start with the, uh, Mr. Kim Jun uh, about your comments. And uh, before uh, we want, uh, move on. That I would like to say, as a moderator, we got only uh, each one. I can really give you three minutes. Yes, I kindly ask you to give it uh, three minutes. Uh, you can give some comments, and then we can move on to the next question. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lee. Um, as the program director of Future Earth, uh, I, I believe that Asian countries should be able to see the right picture and the big picture. Looking back, the outbreak of COVID-19 was unavoidable, but the pandemic was our option. Unfortunately, we were unprepared and have turned inward instead toward nationalism and self-interest. As a result, the COVID-19 outbreak 
turn into uh, as a the pandemic. Program director. Well, this was one of the most painful and costly lesson we have learned from COVID-19. And this can be also applied to our focus on SDG number six, which is clean water and sanitation for all, which has to be connected to other SDGs. The 17 SDGs is all about unity and diversity under the vision of leave no one behind. We Asian countries, including Korea, must have a clear transdisciplinary framework to engineer the vision of SDG in connection with other SDGs. That is so-called transdisciplinary visioneering, which is a harmonious triad of governance, management, and monitoring. And the governance has been emphasized by two previous speakers by taking examples of UN, ISCAP, and AWC. But the other two, management and monitoring, uh, in which all the stakeholders has to participate in from the beginning to the end to uh, craft the usable knowledge and linking them to action. And all these efforts has to be based on uh, scientific principles uh, towards sustainability science. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, next, please, Mr. Lee. Yes. Well, thank you, uh, Professor Lee. <coughs> well, uh, I'm a political scientist, so I don't know much about water issue. But nevertheless, I understand uh, water issue is becoming a, increasingly becoming a very important multilateral issue. So that's why uh, water issue uh, is uh, a uh, important agenda and, and for UN SCAP and also AWC. So having said that, uh, from a multilateral governance, I would like to address two things, uh, particularly related with the uh, Corona 19, uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, what is the uh, weakening uh, foundation of a rule-based international order and global governance? So think about the, uh, at the initial phase of COVID-19, we criticized the how poorly a WHO responded with the pandemic. And also these days many people are concerned about uh, some more function of other international organizations like the UN and also uh, WTO, Paris Climate uh, Convention, etc. So, uh, if that's the trend in the uh, after the in the uh, post the uh, Corona uh, uh, virus virus era, uh, perhaps we need to put input to input some more uh, uh, dynamics to revigorate uh, multilateral governance. And unfortunately, uh, second thing uh, one is uh, second thing uh, is the. Uh, the worsening uh, U.S.-China strategic competition, uh, particularly after the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, we, we all know, understand that uh, China and Russia is heavily uh, debating about the origin of the pandemic. So it will make such a rivalry between two superpowers will make international coordination and governance much more difficult in the world in the future. So having said th those two things, uh, perhaps we need uh, a, some uh, fresh insight to uh, uh, vitalize a multilateral governance uh, in, uh, in almost every uh, global agenda. I think, I think water resources is one of those issues. And uh, particularly, I would urge that uh, strong and rich countries uh, should take global leadership uh, to further enhance global cooperation and also uh, from middle to smaller countries, we need to have a collective awakening about our uh, capacity to uh, multilaterally uh, shape the agenda. So uh, uh, by uh, in, uh, combining uh, global leadership and a collective uh, capacity of the small countries, probably we can have a better uh, uh, handling of the water resource uh, in Asia uh, in the uh, future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, now it's turn to Dr. Shin, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, GGGI, Global Green Growth Institute, is uh, one of the three uh, green sisters. Now I found that uh, our friend is also here, Dr. Jerry uh, Velasco from GCF. We are actually uh, aiming at um, green growth, like uh, uh, climate resilience area, like think tank. And the GG has mobilized 210, 210 million US dollars during the last five years um, bef uh, uh, until uh, from 2015 and 2020. And at the time, actually, uh, we actually uh, understand that 
this uh, adaptation is like very much overshadowed by mitigation issues. And then uh, the Global Commission on Adaptation estimate that investing 1.8 trillion uh, globally in a range of adaptation approach, this could maybe uh, generate 7.1 trillion US dollars in total net benefit. It means that the huge potential from the perspective of adaptation side. Water is very important, like a top, as you, uh, UNESCO mentioned about, this is one of the important like, uh, <coughs> issues of global, like, uh, 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 globally, we are really uh, tapping out uh, more like project, more like, possibilities. Uh, agriculture side, sanitation, and the water sector is likely to be impacted by climate change as post COVID. So uh, just to focus on your, your question, like uh, how can Asia countries prepare for this? How the Korea and then uh, domestic company can need to cooperate with other stakeholders? I must say that we need a strategic approach. I understand that I spent uh, four years in Green Technical Center and having found that there are some kinds of like uh, synergy effect among all the stakeholders in Korea. Now from the perspective of GGGI, I, th I, th I think uh, some kinds of like uh, uh, division of labors among the all uh, Korean company, Korean like, stakeholders, such as public sector and government side must be well, like, or, uh, should be aligned. For example, like uh, adaptation project, water project, there could be like a project identification portion and some carpet building and then also enhancing like uh, pre uh, pre study can be linked to financing mobilization. So actually we have a different like uh, uh, special like uh, specialized institution and government agency. They need to consider like kinds of joint work. We understand under, under the uh, auspice of uh, prime minister's office, there is like Korean chapter ODA platform in Korean Buksa help. I think this is another potential uh, uh, platform we uh, maybe Korean stakeholder including K-Water may consider at this stage. Uh, uh, for our side, we are very much committed also develop um, adaptation project and then also <coughs> climate resilience project now. Currently, we are now tapping more than 20 big projects and some projects we are submit to GCF and then other, other ones are looking for some uh, investment project. Absolutely, some of them should include like water related projects like, or, uh, like uh, for example, like uh, water, wastewater, sanitation, and then uh, circular economy, and then also uh, water treatment project also. So I'm very happy to, to continue to discuss and find the best, the best approach, solution for, uh, for our, our colleague. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have another green institution in Songdo. Can I actually ask the, uh, Mr. De German Velasquez, please give your comments. Thank you very much. Um, I, think, I think the COVID-19 pandemic uh, gives us a decision point in our fight against climate change because the decisions today by policymakers will either entrench our dependence on fossil fuels or create a path to achieve the Paris Agreement and the SDGs. So in order for the COVID pandemic um, situation to create a turning point, climate action and COVID-19 economic stimulus measures must be mutually supported. And developing countries must be able to access long-term aff affordable finance, including climate finance. Unfortunately, many countries, including in Asia, the stimulus recovery fails to prioritize clean energy, for example, and policymakers uh, are not looking at uh, clean energy systems. To, to be part of their stimulus. Developing countries' access to climate finance is also severely undermined by the COVID-19-induced economic and financial crisis. A recent study has shown that uh, up, up till now, an analysis of all the stimulus uh, under the COVID pandemic, that only Germany, the UK, Spain, France, and the European Union are net positive in their investments. That means that more um, positive contributions towards uh, climate change in their stimulus rather than the negative investments. In Asia, only South Korea is leading the group with um, a little bit uh, uh, more positive, uh, but it still has a lot of negative investments and uh, followed by India. Now, um, Korea, I think, can support 
to remove barriers to finance. It can target restoration and construction of green and climate resilient infrastructure. In fact, it is already doing so as part of its uh, recovery. It can also work towards uh, a lot of partners, towards valuation of green standards and labels, developing track record, um, helping capacity building, and um, working towards the problem of systematic mispricing of assets. I think there is a lot of scope for us to work together on this. And we look forward to working with Korea on this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, now I'm asking uh, Dr. Xavier Lefleif in OECD, please. Thank you very much, Chair. And I regret I cannot be with you in Jeju. That obviously improves my carbon footprint, but that uh, doesn't facilitate interaction. Um, the OECD maintains a database that tracks recovery measures at national level and characterizes their environmental impact. You will see that water does not feature prominently among these measures. Actually, the database shows that um, the uh, 30, uh, 336 billion US dollars allocated to environmentally positive recovery measures is close to be evenly matched by non-green measures, so those with negative or mixed environmental impacts. But this proportion doesn't imply that the green measures are sufficient to enable transformation towards long-term climate and environmental objectives, especially given that the billions allocated to green investment may be counteracted by ongoing support to environmentally harmful activities. More than 60% of green measures are sector specific and they target energy and surface transport. This is good news in these sectors account for a high proportion of greenhouse gas emissions in many countries and are often good candidates for quick rollouts if you think about renewable electric projects and electric vehicle infrastructure. On the other hand, measures for key sectors like aviation and industry show overwhelming balance towards mixed or negative categories. Climate change mitigation is by far the most common environmental dimension impacted by the recovery measures that we track. In contrast, other environmental dimensions feature much less strongly. Biodiversity accounts for less than 10% of the allocated funding. Water is also poorly represented, accounting for around 8% of positive measures in both funding and measures. As other countries, Asian governments can do many things. I would like to highlight three. The first one is walk the talk. Green recovery of total COVID-19 spending and significant funds are still allocated to measures with likely environmentally negative impacts. And here I, my message resonates with the, those from the, from the pre, uh, uh, previous speaker. Align, um, so another thing uh, Asian governments can do is align across policies and sectors and over time. The un uneven spread of measures across sectors points to missed opportunities which could help drive sustainability and transformation in key sectors. And here I have in mind agriculture, for instance, or forestry, where you would see co-benefit also in terms of uh, water security, water management. And the third point I would like to emphasize is invest in skills and innovation. The relatively few measures focused on skills, training, and on innovation point to an opportunity to direct more attention to measures that can drive sustainable job creation, notably in industries likely to be negatively affected. That can contribute to ensure a just transition. So of course, there are many uh, other things that governments could do, uh, but these are the three ones I wanted to highlight. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lefleib. Uh, now we are move on to the second part of the, today's uh, the panel discussion. Uh, I would like to give you the tailored questions to each institution, uh, but I gave you a question to fr starting from Asia Center, but this time probably a reverse way. So I'd like to ask the perhaps the OECD first, um, but each um, the, the panelists, please give your uh, answer in three minutes and because we are running out of time. So we see the question is about uh, your contribution uh, the related to the, the significance of global water welfare initiatives and a AWC in the future. Uh, could you tell us about how you can really work together with the AWC 
uh, for Asia and the Pacific and also beyond. Thank you. Yes, and indeed, uh, thank you for the for the opportunity. Um, as was mentioned uh, before, the OECD is collaborating with K Water and the Asia Water Council to support uh, uh, nine countries in the region to achieve ambitious policy uh, objectives. This is really a dialogue with these nine countries in, in the region that covers policies, technologies, and financing arrangements to ensure that water contributes to sustainable developments and the wider policy agendas in the countries. In addition, lessons uh, learned at country level will inform thematic discussions at regional fora, such as the Asia International Water Week hosted by Indonesia later this year. We, as OECD, we will contribute our capacities to promote water as an enabler for sustainable and inclusive growth. And in addition, we will share good international practices that relate to water policies and financing water. As mentioned uh, previously, we really welcome the Korean initiative to develop the concept of water welfare. In principle, we see a lot of value in giving a positive spin to policy discussions on water, encompassing access to water supply and sanitation services, and mitigation to water-related risks. We support the vision of water as an enabler for welfare, well-being, or related benefits that encompass but go beyond water security and sustainable growth. Um, as an illustration, I can refer to recent OECD work on climate change through a well-being lens. Um, our latest report on climate change mitigation through a well-being lens argues that mitigation policies are likely to be more feasible and they, can, they will be more readily implemented from a political, economic, or social perspective. Um, and they will be more effective when there is a two-way two alignment between climate action and broader goals of well-being and sustainable development. Adopting a well-being lens or welfare lens means that societal goals are defined in terms of well-being uh, of well-being outcomes, and these goals are system systematically reflected in decision making across the economy. It also means that decisions are taken um, keeping multiple well-being or welfare objectives in mind rather than focused on reaching a single objective independently of others. And finally, the interrelations between the different economic sectors and systems in which a policy intervenes are sufficiently uh, well understood. So my point is that applying a well-being or welfare lens to water management would require that action in other sectors is supportive of and does not undermine the pursuit of water-related goals. And on the other hand, water action would contribute to other important societal goals and does not negatively impact on key dimensions of well-being or welfare. Of course, there is still a lot of work to be done to, uh, you know, to fine tune the analytical framework um, and uh, translate that into indicators that can provide um, uh, you know, monitoring and guidance for further uh, policy development. Um, but the OECD is really keen to explore this development together with Korean counterparts in the near future. Thank you so much. Uh, now uh, we turn to GCF again. Uh, could you tell us about your basic principles and also future directions, uh, particularly together with Asian countries and AWC? Thank you. Uh, many thanks. So um, most of you would know that the uh, Green Climate Fund is a financial instrument of the UN UNCCC. Um, UNFCCC. And um, although uh, in this uh, replenishment period, which is 2021, 2020 to 2023, we, we do have uh, $10 billion in resources to invest on projects in developing countries, the demand is so high that it would be impossible for our resources alone to satisfy the needs. Um, and one challenge for us is how do we then engage the private sector? Because the real resources are with the private investors. And on water, the issues for us is uh, demand management or supply management. And one focus that we are recently focusing on is uh, wastewater reuse and the creation of a new asset class using wastewater as, as this asset class. So we always conceive wastewater as something we throw away. We think that we can actually reuse wastewater and uh, not just reuse it, it can actually be a means for us to engage private sector in investing in wastewater reuse. So we have been recently investing in projects on wastewater reuse in the northern Gaza. We recently approved the project with AFD, 
the development bank, uh, the development agency of uh, the French development agency. It's a $50 million project, which uh, basically uh, reuses water for irrigation. Um, we also recently invested in a project in Jordan, in Amman. So it is a $33 million project, again, reuses um, wastewater. And, um, but these two projects fall short in engaging the private sector because these are all investments in the public sector. So um, to move to the next step, one of the most innovative projects that we are now uh, working on is uh, a project uh, in South Africa with the Development Bank of South Africa. It is a $5 billion project that actually um, uh, creates, uh, issues a bond and the GCF in fact uh, enhances the credit of local governments, uh, therefore allowing private sector to invest uh, into uh, the development of um, uh, wastewater reuse. So we do hope that these projects will uh, show the way and uh, also serve as an inspiration. Uh, so in the context of climate change, we do need to, to find new means to use the water resources that we already have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh... Now let's move on to uh, GGGI. Uh, we understand now South Korea, we initiated now how to achieve their carbon neutrality and also Green New Deal. And also the green is becoming another, again, the buzzword. I'm sure that green, the Global Green Growth Institute have got many ideas how to achieve this one and also for Asian countries, please. Well, uh, before starting up uh, explanation to your inquiry, during the last 10 years, uh, GGGI has grown up so fast with strong support of Ministry of Foreign Affairs and then also uh, President Ban Ki-moon and our Director General, uh, Frank Reismar, proactive approach. Now we have a, uh, more than more as 400 people like uh, local persons in 60 countries and we have 40 strong members now. And then uh, GGI is uh, very closely working with uh, these members to help design, implement program to assist in catalyzing financing, green finance for green growth and then uh, 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 resilience, like a uh, crime resilience project. So actually when we are now thinking like uh, the approach, we have a strong like uh, 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 our uh, premise, like uh, three, with the three components. The first one is policy side. The policy must be like uh, in line with our strong demand from local government, local, local like, uh, uh, people. We need a design and also promote scale, the mitigation and then adaptation as, um, perspective also. Second one is the project itself. It must be like a mitigation project, bankable, and, and also marketable project. And the, so the adaptation project, it must ensure like a, a sustainability and then maybe possible like a scale up project also. Plus also consider also uh, other colleague mentioned, we are very much interested, uh, focus on uh, stronger like uh, capacity building. This is actually, we are think when you pro uh, promote a new like project development side. And then now, as you mentioned, like a Green New Deal. So uh, the very thank you very much for uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Economy and Finance. And uh, we are supposed to have a uh, uh, five million US dollar Green New Deal fund starting January next year. But even before the time, we already started uh, like a, a large project, uh, large project uh, challenge already. So we collected 30 projects already do one internally, and then maybe more than 30%, we can ensure like uh, adaptation side, 70% like uh, mitigation side. And the, the project must be strong, strong buy-in from our, uh, the strong ownership from our developing country. First, second one is the project must be, we need secure like a uh, financing. Like a uh, project cannot be linked to financing, the project must be dropped. Third one, the minimum size of 15 million plus plus, except the Pacific um, e-mobility project. So why are we looking for this one? Because GGI is now like a lead uh, green growth uh, uh, institution and we need to ensure like a more mitigation and adaptation project worldwide. So the reason why we are very happy to work on that. And we are also very close working with the GCF and other MDB. How can we enhance this project like a development more bankable and sustainable and then also adaptable to our partner countries. So this is actually what we are here. here. And any further question, I'm happy to do this to more discuss. Thank you so much. Uh, now, Mr. Lee, please. Well, uh, one of the uh, main uh, research area that Sejong Institute is doing now is that how to uh, enhance or develop public-private partnership or networking 
uh, in uh, Asia's non-traditional security issues. Uh, the agenda includes climate change, uh, nuclear safety, and cyber security, disaster relief, etc. Well, actually, uh, during the Park Geun-hye administration, I myself uh, worked intensively on uh, pr developing a public-private uh, uh, partnership with those non-traditional uh, security issues. So it was called a Northeast Asia Peace and Cooperation Initiative, and BEPSI in short. And now uh, Moon Jae-in government inherited uh, the initiative and continue uh, it as a uh, Northeast Asia Plus community responsibility, a little bit longer name. But basically there are three uh, pillars. One is the uh, Northeast Asia Peace Platform. Uh, this is a kind of a multilateral uh, discussion forum for Northeast Asia security issue. The other one is the new Northern policy. And the third one is the new Southern policy, which may be some relevance with the Asian uh, water resource issues. So uh, why uh, uh, private, public, private uh, networks needed? Uh, perhaps there is something uh, uh, that can be easily done on the track one level. And some issues can be uh, uh, handled nicely on track two. But in most cases, track 1.5, public-private uh, pa partnership can have a much more synergy effect in some issues. For example, uh, if we combine new southern policy with the South Korea's ODA uh, 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 strategy, and also if we combine uh, uh, some synergy with uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative, even uh, U.S. Uh, in the Pacific strategy, we can find uh, some common ground in those uh, areas. So uh, I uh, uh, would say that uh, if we uh, enhance or develop um, uh, a further agenda on uh, 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 Asia's non-traditional security issue, and water resources is obviously one of them, uh, perhaps it can have a much more uh, positive effect in the future. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mr. Lee. Um, he, he mentioned about the new Southern policy. Of course, that's now the promoted by Korean government. We are now giving some more impacts on the other the developing countries in Asia. And I think it's really nicely connected to the, the final commentator, um, Mr. Kim, about your research cases or research agendas about Asian countries. Please tell us about your experiences. Thank you. Um, as a matter of fact, last week, uh, Asia Center hosted a session at the 2021 SRI Congress held in Melbourne, Australia. SRI stands for Sustainability Research and Innovation. This was the first SRI Congress hosted by key global initiatives such as Future Earth and Bellman Forum. In our session, based on the framework of Trilemma in coping with COVID-19 and also achieving SDGs, uh, we have showcased uh, several um, examples uh, on how different stakeholders are trying to implement the vision of HESS, H-E-S-S. -S. HESS stands for Healthy Ecological Societal Systems in Asia. One of the examples was Bangladesh farmers struggling in climate smart agriculture implementation, which aims, as we know, triple wins of enhancing productivity and also small household income, as well as enhancing resilience to climate change, at the same time mitigating the greenhouse gas emission, um, where, as we know, the water management plays the critical role. The lesson uh, learned was that governance plays a critical role in visioneering to prioritize the triple challenges because of the competing conflicts and interests and also trade-offs among these three challenges. We, Asia Center is currently working with the five Mekong countries, such as Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Thailand, and Vietnam for sharing our experiences, best pra practices, and lesson learned from COVID-19 and uh, our efforts on other SDG challenges. Thank you. Thank you so much, all the panelists. Uh, I'd like to close this session by saying a few words to what we discuss. Um, I'm very much uh, feeling really uh, privileged to come here and also discuss the, all the water issues, uh, from perspective from international uh, agencies, as well as also government institutes, a research think tank, and also research center. And also, that we, we are now understand that we are sharing the same values and same works we have to do, particularly for re achieving sustainable development goal number six. But also, of course, 
the water is also always the central of the all the centrality of the SDG achievements agenda 2030. So we, I think uh, we, uh, we confirmed that we have to work together in Asia and beyond, then we can achieve that some kind of very good deal of the sustained development. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Lee. Thank you, all the panelists, for sharing your knowledge. So, uh, and uh, I am sorry that we had an unexpected system errors and uh, it couldn't go smoothly uh, once again. So, uh, to conclude today's session, I'd like to invite uh, uh, Vice President and Chief Global Officer, Dr. Jung Jin Lee, again, to deliver his closing remarks. Please welcome him with a big round of applause. We now came to the end of the special session. Without a doubt, today's thoughtful discussions with our participants will become, become a stepping stone to solve global water issues and achieve 10, 2030 agendas. In regards to the fact that we currently endure climate change, COVID-19 pandemic, and fourth industrial revolution, the global peace and uh, common prosperity through water can all, only be enhanced with cooperation among the various stakeholders by sharing their experiences and knowledge. It is my firm belief that the session will be an important opportunity to move one step closer to achieve SDG 6 and enhance water welfare. AWC will always be a humble and faithful partner in this endeavor. To call for support from the international community and to set issue war issues at the top of global agendas. We will also put utmost efforts to continue such discussions in the second Asia International Water Week as well. Once again, thank you all for joining today's session. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President, for closing the session. This uh, will officially conclude the special water section, a uh, partner for Asia water issues dissemination and water welfare enhancements. I'd like to hope this uh, result will be delivered to the uh, coming event in November, Asia Water uh, International Water Weeks. Hope to see you then again. Thank you.